go back to Philippians 4 this afternoon. That's where we were this morning. We're going to zero in on what I'm calling the secret of contentment. Are you content today? The secret of contentment. And uh, it really is verses 10 to 13 that covers that subject. <clears throat> While you're turning there, I want to ask you, do you know the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? Yeah. A thermometer, of course, just registers the surrounding temperature, and it's always either going up or down. But a thermostat actually regulates the surrounding, and it changes the temperature as necessary. So if we can apply that to ourselves, what would you be? Are you a thermometer? You're always suffering spiritual ups and downs, depending on your surroundings. Or are you a thermostat that spiritually impacts your surroundings and uh, brings change to situations? If you're a thermometer, you're living as a victim and not as a victor over your circumstances. Well, as you've turned in your Bible <clears throat> to uh, Philippians chapter 4 once again, actually I'm going to start with verse 11. I want to read those verses. I want to have a word of prayer. And then I want to pick out two phrases that uh, we'll key in on. In verse 11, Paul says, not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, I want you to realize I am not telling you that I need something. Why? Because, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I don't need anything because I'm content. Verse 12, I know how to be abased. That is, how to uh, abased, down, live in the basement, <laughs> live in on wet floors, whatever. I know how to be abased. He says also, verse 12, I know how to abound. I know to ha how to have nothing, and I know how to handle everything. I know how to, how to live uh, with uh, an abundance. Everywhere, in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these verses. We thank you for the, the teaching from this man of God who lived so long ago, but our circumstances are very much like his. We have our ups and downs, and we need to know how to become that spiritual thermostat that can impact our surroundings and can bring even the change that is necessary in order to help others. Lord, we ask that you would just bring us in to understand the secret of contentment that Paul shares with us here. And I pray that it would not just be something that we would understand and thus know, but something that uh, would really be useful to us today and in the days ahead, that we would, knowing the secret, would live a life of being content in you. We'll thank you. Lord, we want our lives to honor you in this way. And so we pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Two phrases I would point out to you. In verse 11, notice the phrase, they both begin uh, with I. In verse 11, I have learned. See that? And then in verse 13, I can do. So let's look at that first phrase in verse 11, I have learned. What he means by that in the context is that he has come to understand by experience to be content. Now, notice 
He's learned it. <laughs> if you go to college, when you're a freshman, your major doesn't really matter. As freshmen, most classes are about the same. You take about the same stuff. It's as you progress in college and then get into uh, graduate school that uh, the courses become more and more specific. I say that to say this. Learning contentment is an advanced degree in God's school. It's not even college level. It's graduate level. One of the last things that believers seem to ever arrive at or learn, if they ever learn, is this matter of contentment. It's an advanced degree in God's college. It's a specific course. And I don't know if you've matriculated for this course, but uh, I think that this is probably one of the greatest lessons in the entire Christian life. If we're going to live, what God would define as a successful Christian life, we have to learn what it means to be content. As you look back with me at verse 11 once again, he said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. See the word whatsoever? That means everything. When I was a kid, I remember my dad pastored a church in Massachusetts, and there was a, a ladies' group, a ladies' class. My mother, I think, uh, was a part of this. And the name of that uh, ladies' class in the church was the whatsoever, the whatsoever class. And I think this is probably where they got it. Because what that means is it doesn't matter. Whatsoever, whatever the circumstances are, wherever I am, whatsoever, I have learned, he says, to be content. And here's why. Whatsoever is indication that no matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances that we find ourselves in, they are controlled. They're controlled. The whatsoever means that God's always at work in advance to arrange our whatsoevers, to arrange our circumstances in this way, that whatsoever they all work to fulfill his purpose so that we understand that whatsoever your life is not a series of unfortunate circumstances, but actually a series of divine appointments. Nothing ever happens outside of God's control, even what we would call the bad stuff. This is a life lesson that is vital that we must never forget. This needs to be ingrained in our heart. This needs to be engraved in the fleshy tables of our heart that whatsoever, Whatever happens, whatever the circumstances, it's controlled. God's in this. God is at work in this. It's going to fulfill his purposes. And you know what his purpose is? The purpose of God is that he wants to sanctify you. He wants you to be glorified. He wants you to share his glory with him. And so the purpose of God is to glorify himself by sanctifying you, because this is where happiness, this is where joy, this is where meaning, purpose, and fulfillment comes into the life of human beings. So, first of all, learn this, that your whatsoevers are controlled. And then, secondly, look again at verse 11. He said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I want to talk about not only that our whatsoevers are controlled, but in our whatsoevers, we can be contented. 
The word content there literally means to be self-sufficient. But it's not a self-sufficiency that is the result of you relying upon your own resources. It is The word content there means contained. To be contented is to be contained. That meaning that you have self-sufficiency because of the resources that are contained within you as a believer. And the resources that are contained within you are not things, but they're a person. Every believer has Christ in them, in the person of the Holy Spirit. And our self-sufficiency is in him. It's contained in Christ who lives in us. And so as a result of that, we are adequate for all the demands that uh, we face whether they are unexpected, like coming in this, this morning and the ceiling uh, uh, fallen and water pouring out, or whether anticipated, doesn't matter. We can be contented. We have adequacy for all the demands of our lives, unexpected or anticipated, because our sufficiency is in the living Christ who inhabits us. I've learned, he says, I've learned the whatsoever's are controlled. I have learned to be contented. But how did this come about? Notice what he says in verse 12, where he says, I know both how to be abased, how to abound everywhere and in all things. Here's the key word. I am instructed. The word instructed is the key here to understanding how Paul learned to be content. The word instructed is, again, a word that appears one time in the original language in the New Testament, and it's right here. This word translated instructed actually refers to be initiated into a secret organization. And it, and Paul may have had in mind the, 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 uh, a reference to the secret pagan mystery religions that people would be initiated into so that they would have a corner on the truth, so to speak. And Paul says, I have been initiated. I have been instructed. I've been initiated by God into how to be content in every situation, in whatsoever. So what has he learned? He's learned that his whatsoevers are controlled, and as a result, he's contented, but he's contented because he's been coached. He's been instructed. He's been initiated in the secret of contentment in God's uh, uh, advanced degree in this uh, university of contentment. He's been coached through it. How? I believe that through the things that he suffered, through the things that he suffered, he came to discover the secret of contentment in all of his circumstances. I mean, when you look at the list of some of what Paul went through, it's kind of mind-boggling. I mean, we can talk about Job. Of course, he's probably the, the supreme example of a, of a man that suffered terrible loss in such a short period of time. But uh, look at the litany of things that Paul lists that he suffered in his ministry for the Lord. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're not going to turn there. But I believe that it is through those varied circumstances of suffering that this man discovered the secret of contentment in every circumstance. I think that the Holy Spirit taught this man deep contentment truth through the various experiences that he brought him through. And I think that that is really the way in which any believer will ever learn the secret of contentment. I hate to say it, but it is a secret that we are initiated into, that we learn as we pass through 
all the varied experiences of suffering as a believer for the Lord Jesus' sake. He says, I've learned. I've learned the secret. The Lord has opened to me my understanding. He has coached me, and he's led me through the initiation process through my varied experiences, and I have learned no matter whatever, whatsoever, I can be content. Okay? That's one thing to know it up here. It's one thing to understand intellectually what uh, contentment really is made of. But how do you get it? <laughs> How do you get it from your head into your life? How do you get it to be applied in your daily life? Well, that's what verse 13 explains to us. And that's the second I. He said, I have learned. And in verse 13, he says, I can do. I can do. Now, often verse 13 is taken out of context, and it's used as a means of, of teaching uh, self-help. In other words, you can do anything you set your mind to. You can do anything you want to do. You have it in you. Well, that's half true. You can do only because you have Christ in you. And this is what the really the, the, the whole key to applying this secret of contentment. I have learned I can do. The believer possesses all the power, all the strength, all the ability within to adequately meet each and every demand of life, even though we don't know in advance what those demands might be. That's what he's saying in verse 13. I can do all things. How? Through Christ, which or who? strengtheneth me. Now, there are two things I want you to note about the I can do. First of all, when he talks about being strengthened, it actually refers to strength being infused in and through your life. And so when Paul says, I can do, how can contentment in the head, be translated and lived in the life. First of all, it requires an infusion. That's God's part. And the believer is a new person that has a new life. And that new life is Jesus. The life of the believer is Jesus. And that life is infused into you. The infusion that I'm talking about here, where he says, I'm strengthened, is a person. And that person is Jesus. Do you know that when you are saved that very moment, you are permanently joined to Christ? Your human spirit and the spirit of Christ are joined, like in holy matrimony, a husband and wife, your spirit and that and, and the Holy Spirit are joined in a permanent relationship. And his life, the life of Christ, is securely planted in the believer's life at that moment. And it is the Holy Spirit's desire to totally permeate and continually pulsate in the believer and through the believing life. So that infusion is a person but it also is a power. That's what the word strengtheneth refers to in that 13th verse. The power, the strength, the ability of Christ himself is infused into my life. All his sufficient ability is infused into me so that I can handle anything. You know, back a few years ago, when COVID was raging, my wife and I got uh, COVID. And I remember 
Um, we uh, talked with uh, Warren via text, and Warren had uh, worked at a hospital, and he told us about monoclonal antibodies. And uh, <laughs> monoclonal antibodies, it's, it's just a, a big phrase for you would go to the center, which I think it was Beth Israel on King's Highway, right? Community on King's Highway. We went there. I remember we couldn't come to church on Sunday. We felt horrible. So that afternoon, we got ourselves going, and we drove to Brooklyn, and we went to community uh, because they were doing infusions of monoclonal antibodies in which uh, a monoclonal antibody is that they would uh, they would clone the antibody that matched the uh, antibody in your immune system, that, that particular protein that would attack the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus, the coronavirus. And uh, we had to wait just a short time uh, because we knew Warren. We got right in there, got set up, and uh, they put us in chairs. There was other people in the room, and they gave us an IV in our arm. And they infused through that IV the monoclonal antibodies into our body. And uh, that stimulated our immune system. And I'm telling you, less than 24 hours later, we were feeling so much better. Uh, it had worked. It was an infusion via IV. What we're talking about here in verse 13, contentment. How is it operative in a life? It involves a spiritual infusion. The Christ who is joined to you, who is in you permanently and is seeking to permeate your whole being, pulsates through you his power, his strength. He infuses it through you. But guess what? It doesn't happen automatically. I mean, just as we didn't get that infusion until we believed the science that uh, that uh, Warren was talking about, and actually got up and drove to the hospital that was a, that that was uh, giving it, and allowed them to put the IV in our arms. It would have never happened. We would have never had that infusion. We would have never had that treatment. This isn't automatic that Christ strengthens, strengthens us. It requires your cooperation. This infusion, that's God's part. The cooperation, that's our part. What is our part? It's basically this. You ready? Stop trying to live the Christian life, will you? Stop trying to obey God. You always will fail if you're trying to obey God. You have to trust God in order to obey him. So stop trying and start trusting. You follow me? This is the cooperation part. You want the infusion of his strength, of his power from his person? Then you have to cooperate with him. And the cooperation is two parts. Number one, confidence. That is, you trust that God's in control of your circumstances. You trust that even though it might have been a satanic or demonic attack that would cause that ceiling, uh, you know, that, that uh, thing to, to break at such an opportune time, you still, you're confident that God's in control of your circumstances. And if you know God's in control of your circumstances, you know what that does? It helps you not to murmur. It helps you not to grumble. It helps you not to fight against your bad situation, but meekly submit because you believe that God knows what he's doing. And in the end, it's all good because it glorifies him and it's going to transform you to be more like him. That's the cooperation. It's that confidence that you trust that God's in control of your situation. Now, the second part of that cooperation, not only confidence, but dependence. That is, 
You discover what's possible for you in Christ. You remember Paul's one ambition in life? He says it in chapter 3 and verse 10, that I may know him, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection. You only will discover what's possible for you in Christ as you come to know him, as you come to find out who he is. And when you come to find out who Jesus is, you'll discover, you know what? He's all I need. If I have him in my situation, I have everything I need and more. He's more than adequate. And so it's discovering what's possible by finding out who he is and that he is all you need. And then come, you, you, uh, you claim his sufficiency, his sufficient ability, his sufficient wisdom or strength that he offers. It's already profuse, profusely infused within you in the person of Christ. But you have to ask him to release it through you. You have to take it by depending upon him to do it. Sufficient ability is available to every believer, but it's not yours until you ask him for it and take it by faith. That's dependence. So confidence and dependence, that's how you cooperate. The cooperation goes along with the infusion. I can do all things through Christ. There was a young man that at the age of 26, he was challenged by a missionary speaker to let Christ live his life through him. So he decided to see if it would be possible if he could continue working in the Ford Motor Company and uh, have Christ live through him. So God blessed him, and he advanced through the ranks of the company. Eventually, he became the vice president of the Ford Motor Company. One day, after a very tough day at the office, he went home and he told his wife, would it be possible for me to take a few minutes alone and pray? And uh, could you just hold dinner for a few minutes? And she said it would be all right. And he went to his study, he shut the door, and he stretched himself out on the carpet, and he told God, nothing's going right, something's wrong, I don't know what it is. And he said that God spoke to his heart, and God told him that he was in the wrong place. Well, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that God didn't want him at the Ford Motor Company because at that moment, Ford was looking for a new president, and he was at the top of the short list. And if he walked away, he'd be losing. This was back in the uh, in the late '80s. He'd be losing ten to twenty million dollars. Well, he said, "The Lord told him, so what." I've given you ability to develop great interpersonal relationships, and I want to use you in hospice care to help people die. So Joe Cordick resigned as the vice president of the Ford Motor Company, and he began to work with dying people. Back in the early days when AIDS uh, was just uh, becoming full-blown, they asked Joe at the hospice, if he would take an AIDS case, but no one because no one else was willing to do. And the family had been there hours on end and they needed a break. And they warned him, don't ever touch the patient, wear PPE, the, the, the uh, protective equipment, gloves and robe and everything. And Joe thought to himself, this person is someone that Christ loves. He died for this person. So he walked in without the PPE. He went over to the bed of the patient, and he leaned down, and he gently put his arms around him and hugged him to himself. And the patient asked him, who are you, and why are you here? And Joe told him his name, and he says, I'm here because Jesus loves you, and he sent me to you. And uh, he came into my heart, and he put his love inside of me, so I love you. Well, the patient said, Oh, so you're one of those religious nuts? Joe said, yeah, I guess I am. That's right. 
the patient said, well, at least you touched me. Nobody else has. That five hours that he was with that man, he learned the patient's story. He learned that he was not a family member of the people that were looking over him and with him. Actually, he was the homosexual lover of their son who had died. He had given their son AIDS. And when the family learned that their son had AIDS, he a they asked their son to come home. And he agreed to come home on one condition, if my lover can come with me. Well, the family agreed, thinking that their son would survive longer and they'd have some time alone with him. But shortly after the two moved into the family's home, the son died and they were left taking care of the man that they felt killed their son. Well, the man died a short time later, but before he did, Joe led him to the Lord. Joe Cordick, he learned the secret of contentment to be content whatever his circumstances were because he was he was convinced that God was in total control of life and he was dependent on Christ to strengthen him to do whatever he asked of him that's what it means when Paul says i have learned in whatsoever state i am therewith to be content